All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us here today. I'm Anna Kennedy, COO of Kingsat Capital, and I serve on the board of directors of RealPact. I'd like to welcome all of you today uh, for uh, participating in this third part of our series on racism and exclusion in the workplace that Kingsat Capital is very proud to sponsor. Today, we'll be focusing on the recent violence against Asian and Pacific Islander communities in North America and how we can work together to dismantle anti-Asian racism in Canada. Thank you to all of the industry associations who've come together to bring this series for you. They are RealPAC, BOMA Toronto, Cornet Global Canadian Chapter, NAOP Greater Toronto Chapter, SIOR Canada Central Chapter, Toronto Crew, and ULI to Toronto. Canada, unfortunately, has not been an exception to the recent tragic increase in violence that we have seen against the Asian community, with more instances of anti-Asian racism reported per capita in Canada than in the United States. Since the onset of COVID-19, more than 1,100 anti-Asian attacks have been recorded. These statistics are a wake-up call, forcing us to understand and unpack the racism that this community has been subjected to in Canada. We need to educate ourselves and to improve our understanding so that we can end our complicity in allowing anti-Asian racial injustice to exist in our country. As leaders in commercial real estate and as city builders, let us pledge to educate, challenge, and improve ourselves so that we can collectively champion better and more just workplaces and communities because we'll all benefit from it in the end. I'd now like to welcome Michael Brooks, CEO of RealPAC, who will lead our discussion today. Michael, over to you. Thank you, Anna, for the introduction and to Kingset for continuing to make it possible to have these important conversations at such a critical time in our industry's history. And, and good morning, everybody. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that RealPAC's office is on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. We're bringing you this webinar today during Asian Heritage Month, and we'd like to celebrate the culture and accomplishments of Canadians of Asian heritage. We've got maybe 55 minutes or so allocated for this webinar, focusing on dismantling anti-Asian racism, something that has seen increasing intensity, as Anna mentioned, during the COVID-19 pandemic. The murder of six Asian Americans in Atlanta on March 16th, 2021 was horrific and possibly yet another hate crime. But we can't dismiss this as a US racial divide problem or a US gun problem. Canada has a higher number of reported anti-Asian hate crime incidents than the US, according to the Canadian website, Project 1907. And as Anna has mentioned, there are several other reputable sources reporting our own culpability in continuing anti-Asian racial injustice. Just earlier this week, Bloomberg published a piece saying that Vancouver is the anti-Asian hate crime capital of North America. That is a damaging headline. Clearly, we all have work to do. Canadians of Asian descent are likely the largest visible minority group in Canada, and they are already valued employees, suppliers, consultants, customers, tenants, investors, analysts, and leaders in the Canadian commercial real estate industry. To help us understand this, we have a stellar panel today who will help guide us through the historical context of anti-Asian racism in Canada and what we need to do both individually and collectively to enable transformational change in our workplaces, our businesses, and in our society. Joining us today are Leslie Wu, CEO of Civic Action. Civic Action is a Toronto-based civic engagement organization serving the GTA, and Leslie has been running it for nine months. Just nine months, Leslie. I'm sure you're getting your feet wet, though. Leslie is known to many of us from her years of service at Metrolinx, the GTA's regional transit agency, where for 12 years she led the planning and development of multi-billion dollar transit investments in this province. Teresa Wu Pa is the chair of the Canadian Race Relations Foundation. 
She's dedicated her career to promoting social inclusion, cross-cultural understanding, and anti-discrimination awareness, having started seven organizations, including the Asian Heritage Foundation. She's also a former member of the Legislative Assembly of Alberta. And finally, Gary Yi is a director on the board of the Chinese Canadian National Council for Social Justice. Gary is a lawyer and has chaired four tribunals throughout his career. He was the national president of the original Chinese Canadian National Council, where he led the redress campaign for the Chinese Head Tax and Exclusion Act. Gary was also the first clinical director of the Metro Toronto Chinese and Southeast Asian Legal Clinic. So welcome Leslie, Teresa and Gary, and thank you all for participating. A quick note to our audience before we start, if you have any questions for our panelists, please use the Q&A panel on the right side of your screen. We've allocated up to 10 minutes at the end of the webinar to address your questions. So with that, all right, let's get to some questions. Teresa, let me start with you and uh, the big picture. How do you see anti-Asian racism and how it manifests itself in Canada today? Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me. And I'm uh, joining you today from the traditional uh, uh, land of Treaty 7 and Métis region uh, number three uh, in Alberta. Uh, so uh, very quickly, uh, we see anti-Asian racism, uh, you know, uh, from perhaps uh, uh, learn from if people have the chance from documentary programs uh, in the form of legislated uh, discrimination from the Chinese head tax and, you know, uh, exclusion act and the uh, Japanese internment. But today, uh, and then maybe uh, fast forward a little bit, uh, then we could uh, actually see um, uh, anti-Asian racism uh, in the form of, say, when I arrived in Canada in 1972, uh, and, uh, and the first stop was Vancouver. I, I learned later that uh, in 1972, there was a city bylaw that says Chinese Canadians and Black people cannot stay overnight in an area called the British property unless they were uh, indentured uh, servants. Uh, and, uh, and also I arrived in Alberta and there was a mountain called the Chinaman's Peak. And, uh, and it remained that, uh, you know, with that name uh, until the, uh, uh, the 1980s, then it was changed to the Howling Peak. So, and then of course the Chinese were uh, blamed for the rising housing and, and rental prices uh, taking post-secondary spots, uh, you know, though the, uh, the students are born raised Canadian, uh, we have the actually uh, the history, the participation and contribution of Asian Canadians uh, excluded from our school curriculums, uh, systemic exclusion of historic uh, Chinatowns, underrepresentation in leadership roles, decision-making tables, uh, and uh, more current anti-Asian racism are manifested in the forms of scapegoating, blaming uh, for the pandemic, uh, microaggressions, escalating physical attacks, including stabbing, uh, vandalization of uh, properties. Uh, that actually happened early on in the pandemic in Montreal uh, and uh, online hate. Uh, and also the fact that anti-Asian racism was excluded from all uh, uh, anti-racism policies and strategies in Canada. So those are some of the more current form of uh, anti-Asian racism. Um, yeah, it, it, you bring up a really good point about the importance of understanding some history. And Gary, let, let me turn to you on that point. The Chinese head tax was a big part of our Canadian history of anti-Asian racism. What does that mean for Asian peoples uh, and you personally? And how is that linked to what we see in today's anti-Asian racism? Uh, yes, I mean, there certainly are lots of linkages to, uh, to our history in, in Canada. Uh, you know, you know the, the Chinese first came to Canada in the gold rush. We're talking 1850, right? And then later over 15,000 uh, Chinese workers helped build the CPR, our, our national railway. Um, but right after the railway was finished in uh, 1885, the Chinese head tax was imposed starting at $50, then it was up to $500 by 1903. Uh, that was about two years wages back then. And then, and then even worse, in 1923, uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed and that prohibited, uh, that prohibited all Chinese immigration and that wasn't repealed until 1947. Gary, a quick question for in the head tax. Was that a, 
a personal tax that the individual had to pay or how was it manifested? That, that's right. You could not enter Canada without paying that $500. And, uh, and this was federal government legislation. It was legislated racism, 62 years of legislated racism. So, so the Chinese Exclusion Act, 1923, wasn't repealed until uh, 1947. Uh, over $23 million in those days dollars was collected from uh, 85,000 uh, Chinese people entering Canada. Uh, so, so my own grandfather came to Canada in 1917. I'm going to show you his, uh, uh, you know, th this is his head tax certificate. And uh, this is what, th this is what he received when he entered paying $500. Uh, you know, Teresa has a family background in, in, in the head tax as well. It's a very common story across Canada. Uh, and so he returned to China twice. He fathered three children in those two trips. Uh, he waited decades for the laws to change. But his wife, my grandmother, did not come here until 1954. And then his oldest daughter was only able to reunite with the family in 1964. That daughter was my mother. Uh, that's when I came to Canada. And, you know, it's, it's, it's been a, 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 huge, uh, a huge thing for the families that have been affected for our entire community. And, uh, and we, we started a redress campaign in 1984. It, it took 22 years before the Canadian government apologized and provided compensation in, in 2006. By that time, there were only a handful of surviving head taxpayers left and a few hundred widows. This was not ancient history though, right? These were people alive still who, who suffered directly from this racist legislation. Um, so, you know, I, I, I wish our redress had been more, more impactful. Uh, and I compare it to the, the, to the really huge historic settlement in 1988 for the, uh, for the World War II internment of Japanese Canadians, which which I think most Canadians know about. And, you know, I, I think that transformed their community and how we saw uh, the Japanese people in Canada. And, and I think our community's history of head tax and exclusion, I think that had the potential, unrealized, I think, sadly, but I think it, it had the potential to transform how we saw ourselves and how others see us. So, you, you know, that, that history can help define our Chinese Canadian community as one that, that is over 160 years old and, and has contributed so much to building this nation. It can really help break uh, what we call the perpetual foreigner stereotype. That perpetual foreigner was a great term that you used in our pre-call and, and how do we, get over that perpetual foreigner stereotype and, and get full and true integration? How do we do that? Yeah, I mean, certainly that uh, concept's been around for, for a while and, and you know, the, our, our groups that are trying to fight anti-Asian racism are trying to highlight that, that stereotype as a way to, to define, help define what is anti-Asian racism? How is it different from perhaps other communities' racism. And, and for our community, that stereotype, it, it, it creates a lot of harm. You know, I, I bring it back down to the individual. We know the importance of first impressions. So what's your first impression when you see someone, you know, who's Chinese or Asian in Canada? I, I think the first impression is too often that uh, uh, you, you see a foreigner or an immigrant or someone who just isn't Canadian enough. Uh, so it, it means that people think we're all maybe like connected with China or Hong Kong or you know, loyal. You know, look at the MP Derek Sloan uh, accusing Dr. Theresa Tam of, of you know, divided loyalties, loyalty to, uh, loyalty to China versus Canada. It's just ridiculous and, and, and racist, obviously. Um, so, you know, these, these are the kind of stereotypes that if we increase the awareness, and we'll talk about this later on in, in this session as well, uh, there are ways to try and break those stereotypes. And, and it's really, you know, to, to finish off, 
this is where history matters. It's, it's many of these same stereotypes of perpetual foreigner, the fear of yellow peril, you know, these things that led to 62 years of head tax and exclusion, these things have survived for over a century. And, and, and it's these kind of stereotypes that are more likely to cause racism during tough economic times or during a pandemic. Great pandemic. Leslie, let me turn to you. Um, as a successful career woman in land development and city building, you're, you're part of the commercial real estate business. Um, how has anti-Asian racism affected you uh, and, and your Asian peers? So I think maybe uh, in order to kind of answer that question, Michael, I kind of have to talk about my experience, which, so I didn't come to Canada till the 80s. So, so and I came here to go to university. I, I came from Trinidad. I, you know, I'm a Trinidad Chinese origin. Uh, so, um, and I would say my understanding of Canada as the model country that was inclusive, tolerant, accepting of everyone was what was in my headspace, was what in my, was in my he parents' headspace when they decided this was the country that I was <clears throat> first generate, you know, first one in the family to go to university. What's interesting, uh, you know, to me is, uh, you started off by talking about this, there's this myth in the country, which is, uh, despite the deep history of which I was not fully aware of coming to this country, um, and in fact, all that happened in Atlanta has had me to pause and really reconsider and reflect on the entire 30 years plus that I've been here, um, it really um, is, is hidden. It has been hidden for me for a long time, all these things, because there's, no, uh, there's not enough uh, education or, or knowledge. And so and in navigating a career uh, to where it, it has happened in what I call decades. So when you come as a newcomer, uh, you want to find roots. You want to feel like you belong. Um, you want to be included. And so it, my journey was first, you know, I need to understand what are the rules of the road in this, this country. You start to, as someone like myself, start to code switch. You sort of want to fit in. You start to adapt and, and do things, you know, try to erase your accent. You try to uh, find the lingo and the language. You, you, you suppress so much. And, and so that's number one. And then when, you know, as I was going through my career, I started to kind of, I need to have common experience in order to feel like I belong. And so, you know, university builds that for you and you start to feel a sense of community by shared experiences. And I don't know hockey. I don't, there's so many things I don't know about this country. So feel, being able to fit in is hard work uh, when, you don't, uh, when you don't understand this piece. Uh, but you know, I navigated that as well um, at, it, through many different things. And it hasn't been until the last decade and a bit where I was able to be able to be, and part of why I took this job at Civic Action, to collaborate, co-labor, uh, work together with others to a common uh, purpose and mission and, and outcome that is about uh, a better city. And that helped me kind of uh, sort of navigate that. I'm telling this story only to say that for, you know, 110,000 people a year come to the greater Toronto Hamilton area. They all come with uh, this notion of what this country offers. And we, to me, it's a great opportunity to um, explain all what the richness of what Gary is talking about, all the work that Teresa is doing, to how are we going to move forward? For me, if I had known what I knew then, I would be a lot more aware of when going into a playground, someone asked me if these are my children, am I the nanny? Uh, and, and you're like, at the time it was like, oh, I guess, well, no, I'm not. But you, you just, you slough it over, you bury it. You're just like, I got to fit in, I got to be Canadian. And, and I think, that has been to my disadvantage in, 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 in the sense that not because it has held back my career per se, um, but more in terms of my um, sort of confidence to not feel like an imposter, to more rapid, I, I think I might have been able to more rapidly feel like a part of the community and therefore contribute more significantly and have a greater impact as, as, a, as a, um, a productive member of, of, of the, the, the profession, the industry. So it's a different twist on it, Michael, because I think my experience is a little different, but at its core, um, you know, racism, anti-Asian hate, 
it exists. And I think we just, as an industry, specifically in the land development industry, we have been very slow to recognize it. Very, very slow. That term code switch also sticks with me because uh, it tells me that when we welcome immigrants from all kinds of countries around the world with all kinds of racial backgrounds, uh, even though we say we accept you for who you are, if there's a subtle message about the need to code switch, that's not right. It doesn't yeah, mean that everybody yeah. who has to come to this country, country who played cricket, uh, for example, in their home country you know, now has to play hockey. It's, that's not who we are. That's not who we should be. Yeah. It's a really interesting point. Well, we've made it a part of a survival tactic for people, and it shouldn't have to be that way. Yeah, Teresa, let me come back to you. Um, and you mentioned a few of these. What are some typical racist assumptions and, and microaggressions? I like that term too, microaggressions. And what do they look like in daily life? Well, um, deep-seated stereotypes that uh, adversely impact uh, Asian Canadians include um, you know, some of the terms that have been mentioned here, like the yellow peril, perpetual foreigner, uh, and uh, the model minority, uh, some of the concepts. But I think what I would like to talk about is, I think there's a tendency uh, to talk about these stereotypes as concept, as, as if they are the thing of the past. Uh, so I'm going to share some actually uh, like a lived experience uh, uh, with you. So shortly after I won my first election as the first Asian female school board trustee in 1995, uh, I received a letter from someone who labeled me as the yellow peril. And uh, so it was actually the first time I heard that term. So the notion of having someone of Asian descent in the elected office constituted a source of threat. So it's a source of threat. Um, so a month later, actually this actual particular webinar actually got me rethink a lot of things that happened in my life. Uh, so a month later, a student teacher of Chinese descent told me, Teresa, you have to work harder as a trustee. As I hear a lot of parents speaking you know, in the, in the teacher's room and in, in the kitchen area. And they say someone like you do not represent them. So the other ring by virtue of my race that I'm not Canadian, still a foreigner and always a foreigner. Uh, so a few months later, in fact, uh, we were actually at a meeting to talk about uh, the upcoming um, um, uh, bargaining uh, with some of our staff associations. And the manager who did not like what I was uh, saying at the meeting said, well, I don't know whether all the people who voted for you are Chinese. Uh, and, uh, and then the, the school board happened uh, to pass a four to three vote in support of the Chinese bilingual program. And uh, so I started hearing around me in, front, in public that the Chinese is taking over. We have just balkanized our school system. So again, we are the threat with the yellow peril, when we were trying to do something that would benefit Canadian society, would benefit the future generation of our country. And these are just a few examples to make the point that the biases, the prejudice that people have that holds of Asian as threats, as perpetual foreigners happen much more, much more than people realize. And it's meant to convey the message that we don't belong and we don't deserve to be, and we don't, deserve, we, don't, we don't deserve to serve in leadership roles in this country. We don't deserve to actually aspire to be the best of who we are. Um, I think these are some of the examples, right? And then um, with the current um, escalating anti-Asian racism, uh, some of the people like um, um, uh, Leslie mentioned, right? The experience, uh, some of the female lawyers have had to endure. Uh, in order to survive as, as a female Asian lawyer are coming out now. Because these women are now in the 60s and 50s and they no longer have to fear uh, that uh, uh, speaking up would, uh, it be, uh, would have adverse impact on their career. So they talk about how they've been boxed in. Uh, people actually try to channel them to certain area of law uh, by virtue of their race and gender. Uh, and uh, actually, um, I was also reflected last night that I actually put my son in a scouting program where I later learned through my community work that unit had leaders who actually said to people that he would never let Chinese parents be leaders. 
So I think that we actually have to, to really think about um, uh, how, how this actually stereotypes happen in people's life every day uh, through individual acts, but also sustained by our system. When our system is, when our systems are silent on this kind of practice, then they are condoning and perpetuating all these stereotypes, biases, and uh, inequities. In fact, um, uh, talking about microaggression, uh, my daughter's a musician. In 2020, um, she had, uh, met someone fairly influential uh, at a social event, and he actually said to her, so how does it feel to be the exalted one? In 2020, right? Wow. Um... Yeah, I'm thinking about that, and this actually is resonating with me. We had a similar discussion uh, in our Black Lives Matter uh, webinar that we did many months ago when uh, one of our panelists was mentioning how um, a lot of the schools will stream some of the Black students, you know, oh, you're going to be an athlete, oh, you know, you're going to be in construction, and with it, just based on stereotype alone. Uh, and, and Leslie and Gary, have you come across that stereotype issue? Uh, maybe Leslie, I'll jump to you first. I'm running off script now because this is an interesting point. Have you come across that? It's so subtle, Michael. Like I, I wish, it, I, it, in many respects, if it was overt, uh, we could spot it right away, but it, 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 it's so subtle um, that if you're not paying attention, you don't even notice it's happening. And, and so I would say, um, uh, examples would be particularly uh, Asian women uh, in that I've noticed, uh, particularly if they uh, have an, an accent, um, uh, they somehow they're not capable of being uh, in the communications team. Or, uh, and I've seen the opposite where uh, a, a young leader just excelled in this space and was highly capable. And, but this, this kind of stereotype of what you should fit, you should be in the analytics team. Uh, you're good at math, aren't you? Like, and, and by the way, yeah, you know, I'm not very good at math. So, um, so it's just, I, I think that that it, it, on a day-to-day -day basis, there's these small little uh, decisions or indications or hints that happen that we need to be able to always call it out and just say, no, that's not true. Why did you decide that? Nobody, you can't decide that. Um, so yeah, I, I've seen it. it, but you have to look for it. We're such a polite society in Canada. Uh, everything's, everybody's always, it's, you know, a little bit of passive aggression, smiling and nodding and, and then underneath. Uh, it, sometimes it's as well, I don't want to cast aspersions, but sometimes it's, un, it's very, un, it's incredibly unconscious. Uh, people don't even know they're doing it because they're not paying attention to it. They, they don't notice it. That's a, that's a really good point. Uh, Gary, let me turn to you now um, because I think you've mentioned this. Uh, and of course, we're aware of in, in all of our diversity activities of unconscious bias uh, and this linkage to stereotyping. Uh, you see someone and you immediately make assumptions about them, about the way they might speak about where they're from, about the kind of job they might have, as Leslie mentioned. Um, how do you see the stereotyping problem and, and what are the ways that we can, we can fight that? I, I think we all know about stereotyping. We, we all know we should be sensitive to it. And, and this is, you know, over the years, you know, sensitivity training, cultural competence, uh, it's, it's not good enough. It's not good enough to know about these things. Uh, we really have to somehow practice it. It's not good enough to be nice or tolerant or, or not racist. Uh, again, those were concepts from 20, 30 years ago, multiculturalism, all these things. Now we know more uh, and we demand more. And we'll talk about this later when we talk about the future and, and, and the power of, of social justice and, and, and the groups. Now we know that you have to be really actively anti-racist. You have to work at this. You have to disrupt things. Uh, we, we, you know, we're, we're all fairly senior leaders and lots of high power people on this uh, session. And I'm sure you know about change and how sometimes you have to disrupt things to have change. Well, change within yourself. You also have to disrupt things. So 
so there, there are many things that can be done on, on an individual level and also on a group level. We, we have to do both. We cannot focus just on, on one and we have to coordinate those two things. So I'm just gonna mention something you know, fairly specific for individuals uh, in, in terms of stereotypes. We, uh, the, there's the, uh, uh, well, well, first of all, the, l let me go back to a group level. Uh, the, the data, the evidence backs this up. There are scientific studies that in Canada, not just US, uh, recent ones, where you, you send out a whole bunch of resumes exactly the same, except the last name is different. The name is different. So an Asian, a Chinese last name uh, will lead to about 30% fewer callbacks for interviews. This is scientific. Who, who, who can argue against that as, as a proof of, of racism, of stereotypes? Uh, I, I just, you know, I learn more all the time in preparing for these sessions and talking to people. Uh, I saw a study which uh, just more recently, I think is American, uh, about a legal memo, which again, only the author was identified as different, black or white, and the assessment of that memo and how good that lawyer was, hugely different depending on that. So, so there's enough proof there. But again, see, I'm, I'm being conceptual and, and, <laughs> and let's, let's bring it down to the in, individual. Um, uh, just, just briefly, because this can take forever. System one thinking, system two thinking. Red, red brain, blue brain. You know, there's all these different ways to describe it. System one thinking is fast, instinctive, emotional, intuitive. It's in your gut, first impressions. System two thinking is slower, it's more deliberative, it's more logical. My hero is Spock from Star Trek, right? So I, I like to think I only have system two thinking, but that, that's wrong, that's wrong. That's actually bad. You need to be aware of your system one thinking. And so I'm trying to get more in touch with my intuitive side, my, my non-logical, non-rational side. So it's about mindfulness. We, if we are just more mindful about ourselves, and then we can also be more empathetic about other people. Um, so so th this is what we have to do. We, we have to be more, we have to work on ourselves. What are our first impressions when you see something that's not in your comfort zone or not in your lived experiences. What are your two thought processes? Your immediate one and then your more rational one. Catch yourself, be aware of yourself. When you see a name that's Asian or South Asian or when you see a racialized person or when you hear an accent. Um, so if we work on, on these kind of individual goals uh, plus the systemic ones, uh, we're, we're not only, only gonna become better people, right? Uh, that also will help reduce racism and to bring it back to uh, a lot of people on this call, this is completely consistent with two key principles of any government organization or business. Uh, that's using evidence-based approaches that are user-centric or, or you know, focus on client service. And, and in the end, that's, that, it will help everyone. Michael, can I jump in? Um... I, For sure. Will, will that wreck the system if I, I cuz no. I want to follow up on on Gary's point and 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 two two things cuz I know uh, on the first part about um, larger groups or organizations you know it's interesting I think we need all the individuals and the leadership to move in the direction but in the meantime uh, there there are tools and props to help us. So for example, at Civic Action, we've developed this, uh, uh, it's called a tool called Hire Next. It's a 10 minute assessment. It allows employers to go in and screen their job descriptions or their interview questions uh, and a series of you know, three simple actions uh, that you can do. Start, like just do more than you think before. And then on the individual level, what I, one of the things I think uh, works, can work and is we've seen working it's, it's gonna sound corny and cheesy, but it's about relationships. And so it's about getting to know people. So the stereotypes that you, the only way to break down stereotypes is you start to meet people who look like one thing, you get to know them and you realize, well, this is like a, unpeeling a, you know, an onion. There's so much more to this person. How could I, how could I, how could I? And you know, we've been doing that with this little program called Civic Match um, and, and because it's connecting you know, established leaders with rising leaders, they get to learn about their issues. And I, and I come from this, this place because I myself represent a whole degree, number of layers of intersections. 
uh, with my race, with my, my, my profession, with my back, all these different things. And the more people get to know and, and ask questions and learn and, and connect, uh, whether it's through mentorship, sponsorships, all those kinds of things, they help. Uh, I mean, we need to do a, a times a million of that. Uh, we don't do enough of it. But, but it, for sure, uh, this sets us on the right journey. Um, it, it may not address all the kind of, kind of legislative, systemic, regulatory barriers, but it is one piece of the puzzle. It's a really good point. Um, there's a lot of turns of phrase that are terrific out of this webinar. And I'm thinking about the Spock analogy, Gary, is a good one, um, but, but, but I get that right away. Uh, don't use system one fast brain to make a stereotyped assessment of someone you're just meeting. Go to system two, check your assumptions. Don't make any assumptions about that individual and whether they're Asian or black or any race or uh, religion or any other background, check your assumptions. But, 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 but don't jump to system two slow thinking, thinking that's all you are, which has been my mistake probably for a lot of my life. Be more aware of your, your first impressions, because otherwise, if you're not aware of it, that's your blind spot. How can you deal with it using your rational brain? And uh, someone who's been actually been involved in uh, actually uh, cross-cultural and anti-discrimination training since the early 1990s, uh, I think that uh, what is also needed is to, to really uh, deepen the conversation. You know, uh, as, you know, going to have your first Vietnamese lunch is good, um, you know, but I think how do you actually um, um, move into deeper understanding? And, and also I think maybe part of the challenge is where do we as an organization find the time to do that? And also be mindful that this is not a one-time intervention. Uh, you know, with, uh, like I, I'm gonna go back to my daughter as a musician. Uh, so in the past, um, you know, women are hugely underrepresented in the classical music world. Uh, so one of the interventions was they start to have um, uh, auditions uh, with musicians play behind a curtain. And uh, so that was a good intervention because then people cannot see uh, uh, the race and the gender and age of the person who was uh, uh, auditioning. But, you know, they also later realized, but that was not enough uh, because women's shoes sound different. <laughs> so they actually start to ask all the musicians to remove their shoes. And uh, so, so I think that uh, for organizations that are actually embarking on, uh, you know, um, uh, um, whether it's diversity, inclusion, or, or anti-racism work, do remember that uh, the, we are dealing with some very deep-seated issues embedded in our system for over half a century that have not been critically examined. So, uh, so taking the time to do that um, the first time is great. Identifying where the barriers are is good. Uh, identifying uh, strategies to address them is good. But I think that we have to be cognizant that um, this is long-term work. Yeah, yeah, a lot of great, a lot of great tips here. Leslie, let me come back to you. Um, we've got a probably primarily commercial real estate audience. Um, what role do you think the next generation, well, this generation of leaders and the next generation of leaders should play in addressing anti-Asian racism? We've had a, we've had a few tips, uh, but stuff in our workplaces and beyond. So, uh, I, Michael, I think one of the most exciting things about this job is uh, I get to, on almost a daily basis, work with and interact with so many rising leaders from across this region. And if ever I was to, to speak to anyone to say, what, what is the hope for us getting out of here? It's the next generation. And, and they, um, they are thirsty for change. They have a value system that is uh, sort of so um, rooted in notions of equity and inclusion. And um, they just need a place at the table they need to have their voice heard. They need to have a spotlight shone on them. And, and I would say, so whether it's mentorship programs, sponsorship programs, whether uh, we include them in, in dialogues that we're having, uh, not just as uh, at, the, at the edge of the room, but at the table itself. And I, and, and I truly believe that um, they uh, are going to be how we change and turn this dial up and more speedily. 
And the faster we can uh, have them ready, equipped to be part of this, con this, these conversations on issues of racism and all the urban challenges we face, the sooner we will see ourselves uh, navigate out of this. And so, you know, whether, you know, we, we have a fellows program and, and lots of organizations have different programs to enable young people because um, uh, they, they want to make a difference. They are, uh, they, they want to have an impact. Uh, they are, uh, I don't know, I, I'm just, they are my inspiration truly. And, um, and I know within this industry, there are so many young people who are, who know that uh, the way forward and inclusive economic recovery, everything we're talking about is more than a traditional pro forma sheet. The beneficiaries of all the investments that we're doing have to go, have to be spread further around. And so that mindset is what will help us begin. Uh, and it's a bit of a segue to Gary's uh, point about social justice, our, 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 uh, our future without that is, is, is a little, glim. Uh, so I, I say, look around you, find the, the rising leader beside you that's hidden behind another door, another cubicle, another screen, and, and, and pull, you know, give them, give them the space. It's a great point, Leslie, about, you know, kids that uh, are kids that grew up in mixed classrooms, whereas when I was in public school or high school, they were not so mixed. Uh, and so that um, tolerance is coming and it's coming from a very young cohort in, I would say in most places in Canada, maybe most urban places in Canada. Hopefully that's true. Uh, Gary, your thoughts on, on the next generation of leaders or what leaders currently should be doing to address the anti-Asian racism? Right. Um, you know, we, we're really at a point in our society where, you know, our, our communities, uh, we're, we're, we're in a very different place from 20, 30, even 10 years ago. Right? It's, it's hard to keep up with the changes, uh, especially on the technological side where they say, you know, the, the generations are maybe five years apart, right? Uh, I have three girls who are four years apart and they, they each use technology and the internet and social media differently, very differently. Um, so it's, it's hard to keep up with these changes. Um, but, but this is where the source of power and influence will be for these younger generations. And it, it does have mostly to do with the power of the internet. Uh, we, we know the internet can be very good or very bad. You know, there's too much online hate that, that needs to be addressed, uh, but the, the power of the internet to connect people and, and connect people for bad causes, yes, but also for good causes. So, so it, it can really increase the, the power of networks and allies um, and it's, you know, times are, are changing. I think government and the private sector are starting to see it more so in some places than others that the hold, the hold, the monopoly on power and influence that they've had over the years, it's changing. And so we're yeah. going to see more disruption, more tipping points. We saw the tipping points last year, uh, you know, for Black Lives Matter, we saw the year of or two before that for the indigenous rights movement. This year, sad to say, it takes a pandemic and the Atlanta shootings to create this kind of highlight for anti-Asian racism. Um, and it's not gonna last, we know, yeah. uh, that, that attention. Uh, but the difference is the world is different now. The younger generation is different now. And, and we, we're gonna find ways to work together so that we can help, help drive those changes. Teresa, last, last word to you before we go to questions from, from the audience. Uh, so um, yeah, what's the, what's the way forward on this? We've heard some very optimistic perspectives from Leslie and Gary, what's your thoughts? Well, um, three points um, uh, with uh, my, my belief that um, we would not see different outcomes without actually uh, making changes. Uh, so first, um, uh, yes, uh, we always say the, uh, the next generation is the future and they will be bolder, they will be, you know, smarter, they will be learning from our past experience. Uh, but I'm actually of the opinion, first, uh, we have to change the environment. Uh, so I think that, uh, that they will live up to that better future if our organizations and public entities actually acknowledge the existence of inequities, the existence of racism in our system, and the needs and benefits of being anti-racist, which would actually yield good for everyone, 
for all of us as a people, as a nation. And then the next generation of leaders would have a better chance of developing critical consciousness of the inherent inequities, the inequities of our system, and they'll be more empowered and they would develop greater capacity to really address inequalities and inequities with greater courage uh, and with more support for change. And second, uh, I just finished spending the last two years developing a new leadership program. And, uh, and this leadership program talk about our social identity. We talk about how we've been socialized not to be leaders in this country. Uh, we talk about power, who has power and who do not have power and how do you use power? Uh, and uh, what is your own, what do you bring to the table? What, what, what does Chineseness mean in a Canadian society? Uh, those are the kind of things that we don't get from management leadership because we've been doing leadership training for decades and we did not see any change. You, we keep reporting year after year, oh, women and indigenous Canadians and racialized Canadians are not at the decision-making table. So the next year you see the same thing, but what's changed? The number have not changed. And we've been talking about for decades, the number have not changed. But I think we have to change the way we talk about you know, leadership. And then lastly, uh, I believe in the responsibility and the power of systems, of organization. So an organization such as yours, uh, such as the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, and uh, so uh, you are the current leaders. You have a great deal of power and influence. And how are you using it to tell the people who are being excluded and, and targeted for racism that you would actually take a stand and you stand by them and say you belong. And this, these actions are wrong. So everybody has a responsibility and those who actually possess power and have influence have a responsibility, I would say a greater responsibility to actually to speak out first, not the marginalized ones, not the powerless ones. Why aren't you reporting? Why aren't you speaking? Well, they have to live, um, uh, they have to survive and, and fit the family. They're still you know, uh, climbing the career ladder. So it is the leaders who have power and influence that have to speak out first. And um, you know, uh, as a former MLA and, and, and minister uh, responsible for international relations, what, where do we go at 7.30 a.m. the day after budget? We go to the Chamber of Commerce breakfast, right? So who has power, you know? Who can bring the people of power to the table and, and, and listen to what they have to say? So I think that we all have responsibility in this country to address um, racism, uh, racism and injustice in all its forms. And, uh, and I think it's time to think that, that we all share that responsibility. Very well said. And, and uh, I was thinking of the term allyship, which we hear in, in we heard in reference to our webinar on Black Lives Matter. And, and, um, and I think it applies everywhere in racism, this allyship concept, I think. But let's jump to a few questions while we have some time. We've got uh, 10 minutes or so. Um, this is from Brian, How, uh, and, and maybe, um, I'm not sure who would address this one. Uh, Teresa, this may come back to you. How does the specific lack of government anti-Asian racism protections and policies further perpetuate the invisibility of Asian Canadians in Canada? Bit of an assumption in there, but uh, Teresa, would you take that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Um, well, um... You know, legislation and law sets the wars for society. Um, and also, I think in this case, it also uh, 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 conveyed the message, um, you know, whether uh, you can actually speak about those issues. Uh, as Asian Canadian, um, you know, we, well, I should say I, uh, have been feeling that uh, we have been silenced. Uh, and uh, that, um, uh, you know, we have made some gains uh, in some uh, professional uh, areas. But, uh, but we still experience inequities and, and, and inequality. But we have been, we are sort of caught between, uh, you know, the black and white uh, narrative and, uh, and given our, also the, um, uh, the internalization of the model minority myth that uh, we have been silenced for a long time. So last April, when people start to talk about, try to talk about anti-Asian racism, so, uh, when I was uh, uh, contacted by the media, the pre-interview conversation was, Teresa, is there really racism? Is there really anti-Asian racism? 
really? I mean, it was so hard people for people to to conceptualize, to to actually to to accept. It really actually took the Atlantic shooting to change the perception, to change that people finally accept that uh, anti-Asian racism is real. Uh, it it uh, it happens and is harmful, and uh, it is traumatic, and it does uh, you know affect people's mental health. So I think that um, um, you know uh, to govern is to make choices, and uh, our public entity did choose not to include anti-Asian racism in the policies. Then I think it's time to make those change to make those corrections so that people would not be silenced anymore. So people recognize that this harm, uh, you know, is is induced in in you know all racialized Canadians. So um, yeah, policy actually plays a role. It um, yeah. it really convey a very strong message. Whether your experience counts, whether it's real, whether you can talk about it. Yeah, uh, good response. Uh, in in cruising the chat lines, Moy, there's a lot of there's a lot of discussion. It's a discussion box, not a Q and A box. Um, but there is a question there, which is interesting from Sarah that, that Gary, maybe I'll start with you, Ab, and then Leslie, you may have a perspective on. And the question is, how do we balance the forgiveness needed for reconciliation among our communities with action needed for anti-Asian racism? It's, I mean, if, if you mean specific, well, any community that, that uh, is a victim of racism, some reconciliation is needed. Each of our communities has historic injustices, current injustices. Uh, this is a question related to how do we, how do we get past that if we can? It, it has to be addressed, it has to be acknowledged. Sometimes these, and sometimes these things affect more than the people directly affected. In my example, of the Chinese head tax, it helps perpetuate the perpetual foreigner stereotype, right? There, you know, the, the W5 episode from CTV in 1979, uh, depicting foreign students when it was Canadian, Chinese Canadian students, those things have to be acknowledged and addressed before we can move on to, to certain actions. So I don't think the two are mutually exclusive, but I do think that the injustices need to be addressed to create trust amongst the communities that are affected and, and to uh, address the very emotional things. These are deeply emotional uh, to have historic injustices on our ancestors or on our grandparents. Uh, so th th these things have to be dealt with at the same time as systemically and individually moving forward on anti-racism. I, I know that's a very general high level kind of response, but yeah. uh, maybe I could add in Michael, cause I agree with Gary, they're not mutually exclusive. And in fact, we have to tackle both all uh, at the same time. I mean, reconciliation is about uh, empathy um, and, um, and uh, understanding and learning in order to be able to uh, sort of address uh, the, the pain. And, and on, this, on the same on the same token, we know everybody or you know we don't even look in a mirror has to do more. Like no matter what you're doing now, uh, no matter how, how proud you are of whatever checkbox you've you know whatever action you've done, it's still not enough. And it, so we all have to do more. So the acting uh, and the and the and the empathy and reconciliation they have to go hand in hand because how you know you're going to learn to do more when you have where you understand what the, uh, how deep the, the, the damage has been, and then you can act uh, and you can continue to act and you all, we, I mean, this is decades, years and years uh, in, of, of, um, of, of pain and, and it's not gonna happen in one single act, one hiring of a diversity and inclusion director, that's not gonna be enough. So it's both. Is there an education element to this as well? Um... One of the panelists has commented in here, the fact that hardly anything is taught about Japanese internment camps, Chinese head tax and exclusion act, uh, not to mention the attempts by the BC government to create segregated schools for Chinese Canadians in the 1920s. 
you know, is, is this, I mean, we started to talk about these things in the context of the indigenous communities of Canada. We've talked to talk about the residential schools and, and, and that history. Do we, do we need to do more to talk about this history in our school system? Leslie, everybody's nodding their heads. Well, no, the... we, Gail, yeah, because I mean, I, 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 Trinidad is a, a British colony. So I probably, you know, the history book that I studied probably looks not somewhat dissimilar to what yeah. some, a Canadian would. And, and so there was a uniformity about what colonialism in particular uh, described, defined as the history. And it's not a complete history. So whether it's about Indigenous people, about Black uh, African Canadians, uh, the, the Chinese that first came to the country, we we're doing ourselves a disservice if we only see history through one lens. Yeah. Theresa? Well, it's, about it's about inclusion and exclusion, right? I mean, I, we like to, to use positive terms. We talk about, you know, inclusion, but what we're really talking about is exclusion. And uh, so, uh, so, we, we, so if, if we're excluded, then we have to, uh, uh, you know, uh, take intervention to actually include. Now, uh, when I was a trustee, that was actually 20 years ago. Uh, and this is before TRC and, and all those, uh, uh, you know, and heightened, uh, heightened uh, awareness on indigenous issues. I made a point when I visit schools to acknowledge indigenous children in the classroom. It was small act, but you can see the face change. So <clears throat> having your, your, your present, your community's history included is fundamental. It's about you actually existed and you count. Yeah. Recognition. Um, Gary, do you have a final point on that? Just, just that the common, I mean, it's natural. Everyone wants to feel like they belong. Everyone wants to feel like they are accepted. But really the common immigrant experience is very much focused on uh, seeking that belonging, that acceptance. Um, and uh, you can't feel it. Uh, you can hear about it and learn about it if, if you're not an immigrant or racialized, uh, but it's deeply emotional. I can tell the last two comments, deeply emotional. Um, this has been, to all of you, this has been a fantastic discussion. Um, and I appreciate the time that all three of you have, have spent. We've got to wrap it up now. We've, we've reached the end of our allocated time for the day. And thank you uh, to all of our audience who've logged in today. Th this was obviously just a conversation starter. I hope that each of us will take the time and the opportunity to, to reflect, learn, and change individually, given what we've heard today. Um, again, terrific panelists, Teresa, Leslie, and Gary, and thank you all for candidly sharing your thoughts and experiences and opening our eyes to both the historical wrongdoings, but equally important, a way forward in creating, uh, in our industry, a commercial real estate industry that is intrinsically equitable, diverse, and inclusive. Um, so we at RealPAC, along with our partner associations, will continue to engage industry leaders and other stakeholders to dismantle systemic anti-Asian racism in the workplace, Stay tuned for details on how we can continue that conversation. A special thanks to Anna Kennedy and King Set Capital for sponsoring the series. Thank you as well to, again, to all our participants for taking the time to watch the webinar. And if you have any questions or feedback, please send us an email at webinar at realpac.ca. To all of you, to all our panelists, have a great afternoon and a great weekend all, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you Thanks so much. much. Thank you.